Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, uh, last class we learnt about acute inflammation, we learnt about the outcome of acute inflammation that most of the time acute inflammation, the inflammatory response is able to tackle the injurious agent resulting in complete resolution. We also saw that sometimes when there is a significant tissue injury at the site of inflammation, there can be a scar. In other times we have also seen that if there is a persistent injury, and the inflammation is not able to tackle the injurious agent, then there is a persistent inflammation which is called as chronic inflammation. We will learn more about chronic inflammation in today's class. Before that, we will learn about some patterns of acute inflammation. So, the, what is, how do you recognize inflammation? What are the appearances, morphological appearance of inflammation in tissues? Number one is serous. Serous inflammation is when you have a lot of fluid outpour at the site of inflammation. Example, a blister is formed at the site of inflammation. This I am sure all of you have recognized when you touch a hot pot, immediately within seconds or minutes you will see that at the site of the injury, you have seen a blister forming there. And this is mainly because there is a lot of vascular damage there and outpouring of fluid. And this is characterized by less amount of inflammatory cells. So, it is mostly a vascular reaction with outpouring of fluid. The second type of inflammatory reaction can be fibrinous. As the name fibrinous means, there is a lot of fibrin deposition at the site of inflammation. And this particularly is seen in ca cavities like pericardial cavities, which we will see in the next slide. Separative or purulent inflammation. This is the classical morphological appearance of infection, particularly with pyogenic or destructive microorganisms. And what you get at the site of purulent or separative infection is the pus. The third type, the fourth type is ulceration. Because of the injury, the epithelial surface may get de denuded or eroded and resulting in the formation of an ulcer. So, serous inflammation as I said occurs mostly because of injurious agent. It could also occur when there is an infection by non-destructive organism. Sometimes you have accumulation of just fluid within the uh, joint cavity for example, by organisms of low virulence. So, you do not have pus formation there, it is mostly fluid accumulation. So, here you do not get many leukocytes, but it is mostly the exudation of fluid. So, this is a classical example of serous inflammation where there is a blister formation at the site of uh, injury by heat. The second type is a fibrinous inflammation occurs particularly when there is a loss of vascular damage with leakage of fibrin. A classical example for this is in rheumatic fever, the fluid that accumulates in the pericardial cavity is because of immune immunological damage to the vessels and there is deposition of fibrinous material. So, you have this fibrin appears very uh, cheesy and here you can see the opened heart with the pericardial cavity which has this fibrin strand sticking between the two pericardial layers and this often resolves with lot of fibrosis. So, you get scarring is classically seen in the resolution of fibrinous inflammation. The third type is a purulent or a separate inflammation which we call as abscess. Here the at the site of inflammation you have a necrotic material along with lot of neutrophils, this manifests as pus. So, pus is nothing but neutrophils, the liquefied debris of the necrotic cells and the edema fluid and this is a classically seen in pus forming bacterial infections. <coughs> 
The fourth type of manifestation is the ulcers, particularly in surface epithelial surfaces of the GIT, skin, etc. Because of the infection or inflammation, there is a loss of tissue and the tish, there is a denudation of the epithelial surface. Lower left you can see a gastric mucosa, you see a punched out hole there, that is an ulcer which classically ex occurs due to infection by bacteria like Helicobacter pyrori and on the right you can see is a microscopic picture, you on either sides you see the normal mucosa and in the center you see that the epithelium and the underlying tissue is completely destroyed and that is an ulcer. So, this also could be a morphological appearance of inflammation or infection. So, these are the four types which we just learnt. So, it could be a serous inflammation, it could be a fibrinous inflammation, it could be a separative inflammation where you have pus or it could be an ulcer. So, all these are different morphological appearances of inflammation in various tissues when there is injury by various different kinds of uh, agents. So, next coming to another important topic that is the systemic effects of an acute inflammation or acute phase response. We know that when we have a sore throat or an infection in any part of a body, we also get fever. So, fever is an important systemic effect of acute inflammation. So, what causes fever in inflammation? It could be generated because of the action of exogenous substances. For example, the lipopolysaccharides of the bacterial cell wall act as pyrogens, they increase the temperature. Also endogenous substances most importantly the cytokines, interleukin 1 and the tumor necrosis factor are endogenous pyrogens. So, both these substances whether exogenous lipopolysaccharides or the endogenous pyrogens, they uh, induce fever. They also, we also know that when we have an infection, systemic infection or a severe infection, you have the pulse is, uh, in, there is tachycardia and elevated blood pressure. Also, one may experience chills and anorexia. So, these are all the effects of cytokines uh, that result in these manifestations in inflammation. The other important acute phase reaction is leukocytosis. That is, these cytokines, they act on the bone marrow. So, there is increased synthesis of leukocytes as well as their release into the circulation and to the site of injury. So, this is a defense mechanism to increase the leukocyte production and their accumulation at the site of injury. So, the next thing is acute phase reactants. So, acute phase reactants are mostly produced by the liver and some of the acute phase reactants that we know are C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, interleukins, serum amyloid associated etc. So, when we have a raised C-reactive protein in the blood that signifies that there is infection. Raised ESR we know is a feature of infection. This is also a manifestation of inflammation because of the release of cytokines. These molecules are produced by the liver and released into circulation. Hepcidine is another acute phase reactant. We know that in individuals who have chronic inflammation because of the release of hepcidine, hepcidine is a molecule that interferes with iron utilization by the marrow cells resulting in anemia. So, in patients who have chronic inflammation, there is often anemia because of the release of histamine, hepcidine which interferes with iron utilization and there is anemia. In severe infections called as septic shock, the high levels of tumor necrosis factor and interleukins, we just learned that they are very important in inflammation, they play a very important role in inflammation mediating various reactions that are responsible for the inflammation to occur. But when they are produced in very high amounts as in case of severe infections, they can have pathological effects. So, what are the pathological effects that occur because of cytokines? They result in widespread endothelial activation. When there is widespread endothelial activation, there is platelet aggregation and thrombosis. So, there is disseminated intravascular coagulation that can occur as a complication of infection because of massive amounts of release of cytokines. In addition, there are certain metabolic 
abnormalities like insulin resistance and also these interleukins and TNF can suppress the myocardium. So, one can have a fall in the blood pressure because of the myocardial suppression. So, let us try to answer this question. A 22 year old man develops marked right lower quadrant abdominal pain and fever since 2 days. On physical examination, there is tenderness on palpation over the right lower quadrant. Clinical diagnosis of acute appendicitis is suspected. The pain experienced is a result of which of the two chemicals? So, we are asking a question here on which are the chemical mediators that are responsible for pain that occurs in inflammation. Is it complement C3B and IgG? Is it interleukins and TNF? Is it histamine and serotonin? Is it prostaglandins and bradykinins or leukotrienes? So, the answer, correct answer here would be prostaglandins and bradykinins. So, the pain that one gets in inflammation is because of prostaglandins and bradykinin. If you are asked what is responsible for fever, it would be interleukins and tumor necrosis factor. Next, we move on to the next topic that is chronic inflammation. So, we learned that if the inflammation is not able ta to tackle the injurious agent or there is a persistent infection or a persistent injury, then you have chronic inflammation occurring. So, by definition, chronic inflammation lasts for a much longer time while uh, acute inflammation usually takes a few days to maybe a week. But chronic inflammation, when there is an inflammatory response that has a prolonged duration of weeks to months, we call it chronic inflammation. And what characterizes chronic inflammation? Here, there is a persistent inflammation, persistent injury and at the same time repair. So, repair is a phenomena that is seen in chronic inflammation, which you do not see in case of uh, acute inflammation. Repair can occur as a consequence of acute inflammation, but chronic inflammation as the inflammation is going on, there is a lot of fibrosis and scarring that happens and these occur in various combinations in chronic inflammation. So, what are the causes of chronic inflammation? Number one and the most important is persistent infection. So, if the inflammation is not able to be eradicated by the acute inflammation, for example, tuberculosis is an infection where the inflammation, the macrophages are not able to eliminate the bacteria because in tuberculosis, the mycobacteria prevent the fusion of phagosome and lysosome. That is a very important step in phagocytosis and killing of the bacteria. So, that is the reason tuberculosis is usually a chronic inflammation. It cannot be handled by acute inflammation and phagocytosis or if there is an unresolved inflammation for some reason. The next important reason why chronic inflammation is hypersensitivity, for example, autoimmune diseases. In autoimmune diseases, the antibodies or the immune system of our body finds our own antigens as non-self and whose uh, continuous uh, uh, immune reaction resulting in tissue damage and whenever there is a tissue damage, you have inflammation. So, that is the second instance where you have chronic inflammation. The third one is if you are constantly being exposed to toxic agents like silicosis or asbestosis. And the and then the various other diseases. We now know that atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory disease in response to various factors like hyperlipidemia or various other factors. So, these are all the instances where one can get chronic inflammation. So, what are the key players in chronic inflammation? We learned that in acute inflammation, it is the neutrophils and the macrophages are the dominant cells that are responsible for the inflammatory response. In chronic inflammation, again you have macrophages. So, macrophages play a role both in acute and chronic inflammation. In addition, the lymphocytes and the plasma cells. So, these are the dominant players in chronic inflammation. So, what are the characteristic features of chronic inflammation? In acute inflammation, we see mostly the neutrophils and the macrophages. In chronic inflammation, we have mostly the chronic inflammatory cells, which means lymphocytes, plasma cells and the macrophages. So, the infiltrate in chronic inflammation is lymphocytes, plasma cells and the macrophages. In addition, it is almost always there is a because of the persistent injury and damage, there is a significant tissue destruction. In addition, there is fibrosis. So, fibrosis 
and scarring goes alongside the inflammation because it is a persistent injury happening in chronic inflammation. Here you can see a picture of the kidney. You can see the glomeruli within the Bowman space and normally the, the glomeruli are surrounded by tubules. Here we see that the tubules are completely destroyed. We do not see any tubules there. Instead, between the glomeruli, you see a lot of fibroblasts. The spindly cells between the glomeruli are the fibroblasts. And then there is a lot of infiltrate, which if you go to the higher magnification, you can identify them as lymphocytes or plasma cells. So, what we see here in chronic inflammation is tissue destruction, a lot of fibrosis and infiltration by inflammatory cells which are mostly the lymphocytes and the plasma cells. So, we saw that both in acute inflammation and chronic inflammation, the macrophages were involved. So, is there any difference in the macrophages that you see in acute inflammation and chronic inflammation? It is now recognized that there are two types of macrophages, the M1 macrophages and the M2 macrophages. The M1 macrophages are the ones that you see in acute inflammation in response to microbial infection, foreign substances, etc. And then the function of the M1 macrophages is to eliminate the injurious agent. So, they release a lot of toxic substances like nitrous oxide, lysosomal enzymes, cytokines, etc. And in case of um, M2 macrophages, it is seen that you have M2 macrophages in chronic inflammation and these are generated when they are activated by T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes recognize that the inflammation is not being tackled by acute inflammation and then it releases a different set of cytokines like interleukin 4, interleukin 13 which causes activation of M2 macrophages and the role of M2 macrophages is mostly to cause tissue region repair and regeneration, angiogenesis and fibrosis. So, we can see that M1 macrophages their role is mostly to eliminate the microbial agents in acute inflammation while M2 macrophages are generated mostly in chronic inflammation and their role is to bring about repair and fibrosis of the injured tissue. So, this is again the same thing. So, the, the M1 macrophage generation is called as the classical pathway of macrophage activation and the M2 is the alternate. So, normally it is the classical. Whenever there is an injurious, it is a M1 or the classical pathway that is activated and you can see here the microbes uh, activate the classically activated macrophage M1 and they produce various toxic substances which are responsible for microbicidal killing. Whereas, the M2 generated whenever the acute inflammation is not able to tackle it, the T lymphocytes secrete various cytokines and you have the M2 generation which results in more of tissue repair and angiogenesis. So, the tissue macrophages are the dominant players whether acute inflammation or chronic inflammation, macrophages play a very dominant role. In acute inflammation, we have mostly tissue injury caused by various metabolites like the nitrous oxide, arachidonic acid metabolites, etc. But in chronic inflammation, you have more of growth factors and angiogenesis. Although in chronic inflammation, there is also some amount of tissue injury by the generation of these various toxic substances. So, this figure shows here, normally when there is inflammation, there is emigration of macrophages to the tissues and this is the M1 macrophages which produces various toxic substances and tries to eliminate the injurious agent. When that is not happening effectively, then the T lymphocytes stimulate the macrophages and they get converted to M2 macrophages. So, what we see here is that in inflammation, there is a lot of crosstalk that goes on between the macrophages and the lymphocytes re resulting in whether the M1 or the M2 uh, system has to be activated in response to the injury. So, what is the role of lymphocytes in chronic inflammation? Now, the lymphocytes particularly the helper cell subset has various types, the T helper 1 type, the T helper 2 and the T helper 17 type. Now, T helper 1 
lymphocytes are mostly involved in the generation of interferon gamma and they lead to the classical type of macrophage activation. While the T helper 2 are mostly in chronic inflammation, they release interleukin 4, 5 and the 13 and responsible for the alternate pathway of macrophage activation and the 17 is also produced in acute inflammation, it recruits lot of neutrophils. So, that brings us to the end of chronic inflammation. So, we have learnt that chronic inflammation occurs when there is a persistent injury or when the acute inflammation is not able to tackle the in, uh, in injurious agent as in case of classically with mycobacterium tuberculosis, you have the chronic inflammation happening and in this the dominant players are the lymphocytes, plasma cells and the macrophages. We also learned that chronic inflammation persists for a longer duration and the most important features that you see in chronic inflammation are tissue injury, fibrosis and infiltration by lymphocytes and plasma cells and these occur in various combinations depending on the type of injury and the tissue. Thank you.